Before we get going with uh, introducing our speaker tonight, I just wanted to mention that we um, are OSEP programs, outdoor science education programs for children. Um, we started registration for those programs this morning. We're gonna be able to run those programs this summer, which is super exciting. And uh, we have quite a few spots left open. So if you have kids or grandkids or neighbors or friends with kids, um, please check out our website um, and you can navigate to that uh, by going to our education and outreach section and then just look for outdoor science education program and you can sign up online there. Um, and even if some of the classes look like they're full, you can sign up for a wait list. And, you know, all of the programs will be relatively small class sizes. They'll be all outside because um, they'll be wearing masks and they will be safe and fun. So um, doing what kids should be doing in the summertime, running around in nature. So check that out if you're interested. And um, We'll, uh, we'll let you know, um, Carol Lester runs those programs and she'll let you know as you get registered if you've, um, if you've gotten off the wait list. Okay, so on to the main event. It is uh, my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker for two reasons. One is because it's like a really awesome topic, um, talking about something that's really at the heart of ecology. And then number two, John Schur is a good friend of mine, and he is probably one of my favorite snarl researchers um, here. And he and his lab group are, um, they're all really smart people doing interesting work and a lot of fun to be around. So we really appreciate having them here. Um, and uh, snarl, John and I actually do go way back. So um, when I was at UCSB as a researcher, John was also a postdoc at UCSB, and we ended up um, collaborating on a couple of different top, you know, projects and papers. And uh, John, I have to say that the uh, Trophic Cascades paper is a highly cited paper <laughs> that, uh, that we collaborated on back in the day. And so it's really fun um, to have John sort of back in my life again, now that I came to Snarl, um, it was uh, kind of a little bit of a surprise that he was also doing his work here. So now we, we've, we've come full circle and we get to work together again, which is, which is great. Um, his lab group uh, at UC San Diego now uh, studies variation in the structure and function of aquatic ecosystems, as well as the consequences for people. And his lab studies the interactive role of climate, predators, and resources, as well as the importance of evolutionary changes for these ecological processes. Um, John was, uh, as I mentioned, a postdoc at UCSB. In 2003, he became a professor at the University of British Columbia, um, where he actually spent some time working in marine systems uh, from aquatic systems. And then after, um, being a professor at U University of British Columbia in 2011, he moved to UC San Diego, where he is now. Um, when he got back to UCSD, he returned back to his work in freshwater systems, and he began working at Snarl and in the High Sierra Alpine Lakes, as well as some more exotic locations he's going to talk about tonight. So, um, a few months ago, you know, during the COVID times, I was here in my kitchen making coffee in the morning and I heard this familiar voice on NPR and I was like, it's John on NPR. And uh, there he was talking about some of his work that he's going to share tonight. Uh, he was looking at the effects of species and introductions on ecosystems. And uh, some of this work that he'll talk about tonight involves working on hippos. Um, in South America, hippos, hip, do you say hippopotamuses or hippopotami? <laughs> or just hippos? I think, yeah, I, I don't know if it's, if it's like fishes or if it's more than one kind of hippo, I don't, I don't know. I'm just going to, I'm just going to stick with hippos. Okay. And hippos are, I mean, I know we have all have our, you know, imaginations about what it, what it might be to be like around a hippo. Um, I think they're really amazing sort of animals because uh, they have a rare combination of being super dangerous as well as uh, an herbivore, which is not something you often uh, think about together. Um, 
Also, if you're thinking that like, wait a minute, hippos aren't in South America, <laughs> aren't they from Africa? Um, that's even a more interesting story that John will talk about tonight. So it, I think it's also just a great example of how an animal like that that's introduced to a novel ecosystem um, can have these effects and allow us to um, look at this sort of as a natural experiment, something that we would never do intentionally, but we have the opportunity to take a look at. So um, anyway, it's my great pleasure to introduce John and uh, thanks John for coming and speaking with us. Thanks, thanks Carol for inviting me and it is, it is great fun to get to work uh, at Snarl with Carol now in charge. We are, we have, she is one of my favorite, oldest favorite, favorite collaborators of all time. And so it's really, it's really great to be able to be up there. And for a little Snarl content, I put Mount Morrison in the background there so we can all pretend that we're in the page center right now uh, as, we, as we should be, uh, but this is the next best thing. Okay, as Carol mentioned, I'm gonna talk today about two stories uh, about animals finding themselves uh, in a new environment, uh, one uh, close to where it started and one very far, uh, and what effect these animals have on the ecosystems that they live in and how we study those effects uh, and how we understand uh, and interpret ecological change uh, through time. So this is a, an animal mashup of two different, two different species. So I wanna start with a, what I think is a really remarkable and astounding and underappreciated fact. Uh, and that is that humans have really profoundly uh, changed the distribution of animal biomass around the world. So this figure shows if you took all the animals in the world and got the world's biggest bathroom scale and weighed them all and then sorted them into different uh, groups, different phylogenetic groups, uh, how much biomass would be represented by these different groups. Uh, and so I know that uh, colloquially uh, animal is often sort of synonymous with mammal, but everything on this picture is, is in the animal kingdom. Uh, and so about 42% of the animal biomass of the weight of animals in the world is represented by arthropods, by insects and spiders and crustaceans in the ocean like crabs and uh, shrimp and things like that. Uh, the next biggest group, the next biggest part is the um, uh, is the vertebrate in the vertebrates is the fish here, so represented by this uh, aquarium fish, uh, and then that's about twenty nine percent. And then the next biggest parts are the annelids, like this earthworm, uh, and mollusks, like these like snails and clams and mussels and things like that. And then you get into the terrestrial vertebrates. And among the terrestrial vertebrates, the most biomass is contained in livestock, in cows and sheep and pigs uh, that humans grow uh, for food and, and other purposes. And the next biggest group then is humans ourselves. So we humans represent about 2.5% uh, of animal biomass in the world. And there is no other uh, large vertebrate, a large animal, uh, that represents nearly as much biomass. We are by far uh, the, the dominant uh, large animal in terms of biomass. And in fact, humans together, we as one species weigh almost 10 times as much as all the wild mammals put together. So all the deer and the mouses and mice and the uh, kangaroos and the elephants and the dolphins and everything else, they only weigh about 10% of what the humans, we 7 billion human people weigh together and the wild birds are even less than that. And so humans have really co-opted or represent, we and our commensal farm animals uh, represent the lion's share, really the dominant part uh, of terrestrial vertebrate biomass in the world. Uh, and it really wasn't, uh, it hasn't always been that way. So until fairly recently, these other wild mammals and birds represented a lot more biomass uh, than they do today. And so this is a relatively recent situation. And so if you look uh, going back about 15,000 years ago, which is not that long, um, the, uh, the, at the end of the Pleistocene, there was a large extinction event uh, of large uh, terrestrial mammals. So these are, this is the biomass distribution of terrestrial mammals that went extinct around 15,000 years ago, uh, around the same time uh, the humans arrived in, in the New World, also in Australia, uh, and the average mammal that went extinct in the Pleistocene, so these are things like this giant sloth, or these woolly, you know, these mastodons, woolly mammoths, uh, saber-toothed tigers, dire wolves, all these 
really giant animals uh, that were around until fairly recently. And the average biomass of the of an extinct Pleistocene mammal is about 182 kilograms. So that's about 400 pounds. And so that's a really big animal, right? So the, so, and some of them were much, much bigger, right? The mastodons and the mammoths and everything else, uh, they're way out here in the approaching 10,000 kilogram uh, size category. Uh, and so humans caused a, prehistoric humans caused an extinction, a selective extinction of the largest terrestrial mammals uh, in the world at the time. And the ones, the mammals that have gone extinct in our own era of the last couple hundred years, so these are animals that are uh, extinct. The next group is animals that are extinct during the Anthropocene during the uh, recent couple hundred years. Uh, this is a thylacine, a marsupial from uh, Tasmania. Uh, their average biomass is about 0.7 kilograms, so 700 grams. Uh, of the mammals that are currently threatened with extinction, that are in danger of extinction, their average mass is about 0.44 kilograms. And the ones that are doing okay, that are not in danger of extinction, their bio average biomass is about 0 0.06 uh, kilograms, and so, so 60 grams. Uh, so humans have caused the selective extinction of the largest uh, terrestrial mammals uh, throughout the world. And a similar uh, story has unfolded in the ocean as well. Uh, so the story I'm going to tell you is about uh, under trying to understand what effect these animals, these extinct animals once had on their ecosystems uh, and what effect their, their, contemporary, uh, their contemporary relatives are having on their ecosystems. So I'm going to talk about two recent arrivals in uh, ecosystems, one close to home, uh, and that's the colonization of the Yosemite Valley, the Merced River, uh, and the Yosemite Valley by river otters. So that is not an invasive species, a native species, but one that moved up in elevation. So moved, uh, so native at lower elevations, but uh, in 2014 first showed up in the Yosemite Valley. Uh, and then the second part of the talk is about the effect of common hippos in Colombia, as Carol mentioned. Uh, so we'll begin, uh, so before we begin, sort of take you back how uh, this project began. Uh, so this project, so the river otter project is sort of an offshoot or a uh, way of welding together of two other projects that I've been involved in and done during my time. So when I was, as Carol mentioned, when I was a professor in Canada, I worked on kelp forest ecosystems and, uh, and the effects of sea otters on marine invertebrates like these sea urchins. Here's a Pycnopodium sun star here uh, and kelp forest ecosystems. So these are all uh, up here are black rockfish in a, in a kelp forest on Vancouver Island. Uh, and so my colleagues and I, so this is our research team here, uh, we're trying to understand uh, the effect of river of sea otter uh, recovery on kelp forests. So when sea otters reinvade uh, territories where they've been extinct, uh, they tend to eat up all of these invertebrates like these sea urchins. Uh, these sea urchins are big grazers on these kelp forests. Uh, and so you often see a big expansion of kelp forests. So this picture here in the upper left uh, is what it looks like on Vancouver Island in areas where there are sea otters, where sea urchins are very rare uh, and where kelp forests are very extensive. Uh, and this has big effects for uh, the value of, of the coastal economies relating to seafood, uh, about fishing for uh, fin fish like these, uh, these rockfish versus invertebrates like these sea urchins. So that was work that I did while I was in Canada. And since I moved to California, I started working on the effects of trout stocking on mountain lakes and how the effects of trout stocking varies at different elevations. So how the climate uh, and the presence of predators affect uh, the functioning of lake ecosystems, the distribution of organisms like these, these plankton here, these are zooplankton, these little red and black things here, uh, amphibians like these guys, this is a, a plain stocking trout uh, in a mountain lake, and then ecosystem functions like uh, production of, uh, of algae, growth of algae and decomposition of leaves, things like that. Uh, so in the course of doing that work, uh, of course you have to get permits, uh, and in applying for permits, I got to know uh, Rob Grasso, who's the uh, aquatic ecologist in Yosemite National Park, uh, and I uh, started chatting with him. Uh, and he alerted me to the, the recent uh, discovery that river otters had uh, shown up within Yosemite Valley in, uh, in, in, uh, in the Merced River. 
Uh, and so he told me that, there were, that river otters had started being seen uh, throughout the Yosemite Valley. Uh, Rob was concerned about this because the park actively manages for endangered species like uh, red-legged frogs uh, and western pond turtles. Uh, I don't know really well if we were trying to find out what river otters eat. Uh, you can certainly imagine them eating turtles and frogs. Uh, and so I started a project with a couple of uh, graduate students, master's students, Stefan Samu and Stephanie Lee, shown here, uh, who spent the summer on understanding, trying to understand the potential effects of river otters on the, uh, on the Merced River uh, ecosystem. And in doing this, we started collaborating also with Cynthia Steiner here, uh, who is a geneticist at the San Diego Zoo Institute for Conservation Research, who uses uh, genomic tools to uh, ask ecological questions. Uh, and so we uh, said, so we set out our goal for this project was to estimate how, how otter, the arrival of otters might affect uh, communities and ecosystems uh, in the Merced River. And so uh, to answer that question, we started by asking, well, uh, how much food does an otter need to eat? Uh, and so we use estimates of metabolic rate uh, to estimate how many calories an otter needs to eat every day uh, to meet its, its basic needs. So how much food does it need to eat? Uh, and the next question is, well, what are, what are these otters eating? Uh, and to do that and to ask that question, we turn to uh, we, the uh, field of forensic scatology uh, using DNA sequencing uh, to identify diet items in the scat. So taking scat samples of river otters, uh, extracting DNA, sequencing, uh, amplifying different regions, sequ sequencing them, and from that identifying what uh, organisms were in the diet. Uh, and then estimating the caloric content of different prey items, uh, we were able to estimate how many uh, of different prey otters eat every day. Uh, and then to estimate their impact, we said we used estimates of the uh, population sizes of these different preys uh, from surveys of fish. So the two main diet items that we've been able to really identify are crayfish uh, and then fish like trout and Sacramento suckers uh, that are found in the Merced River. Uh, and so trying to do this, we were trying to figure out how we're trying to start to estimate uh, what effect river otters might have on different organisms throughout the Merced River uh, food web. Uh, and so uh, Stephanie and Stefan set out for the summer. Uh, they began their master's degrees. They uh, uh, headed up to Yosemite Valley. They stayed at the Yosemite Field Station, another NRS station in Wawona, uh, and they, asked, they measured uh, different aspects of river uh, ecosystem function, like uh, production of benthic algae. So here's little plates for measuring algae growth. Uh, decomposition of leaves, uh, and uh, and then the distribution, and then the abundance of different prey like these uh, crayfish that they are sampling with um, uh, with minnow traps here. So they spent the summer uh, running around Yosemite Valley. Uh, it was uh, a very very wet year that they were there, and so the Merced River was uh, in full flood stage when they arrived. Uh, and they, uh, they faced many adversities, uh, but being uh, determined and uh, intrepid young people, they, uh, they, they, uh, they face those adversities uh, with admirable, uh, admirable uh, energy. Uh, and so this is, a, this is from a, a picture that Stephanie took of an otter eating a trout uh, with, her, with her cell phone. Uh, so, during, so during this time, their goal was so that Rob Grasso from the National Park told us uh, where they had seen river otters. He said, okay, we think all the river otters are found in this, in this reach of the Merced River. And so Stephanie and Stefan set out to do sampling in areas, parts of the Merced that either had river otters or didn't. Uh, and in the course of doing this, they discovered that all of the Merced River in Yosemite Valley has river otters. Uh, and so this is, uh, this picture was taken on the day when they observed uh, river otters in a in a place in a part in one of their control sites that was supposed to not have uh, river otters, so they were a little bit distraught about that. They also identified uh, so it turns out that otters are very fastidious creatures and always like to go to bath the bathroom in the same place. Uh, and so there are otter latrines, and in the course of doing their work, uh, they identified a bunch of these sites. And so this is uh, otter scat that they found on the bank of the river, uh, and so they started collecting these scats when they had the chance. Uh, and bringing them back to do sequencing uh, and identify the, uh, the uh, prey items that, that made up the scat. 
Okay, so how did they identify the prey items? So we worked with, as I mentioned, Cynthia Steiner uh, at the San Diego Zoo Institute for Conservation Research. Uh, the San Diego Zoo uses a lot of genomic tools uh, in conservation. So they have the frozen zoo. So this is uh, some of their scientists uh, with uh, samples of endangered species that they are maintaining. Uh, and, they, and Cynthia uh, has worked on jaguars in South America, uh, identifying their prey items from their scats. So she has used uh, these genomic tools uh, in, in these situations. Now, it turns out that jaguars are a little bit easier than river otters uh, because they, they pretty much always eat vertebrates. That is, they eat mammals and birds and reptiles, uh, but they don't really eat bugs that much, or at least we don't think they do. Uh, whereas river otters eat both vertebrates and invertebrates, and you have to use different uh, sequencing tools for uh, to identify vertebrates versus invertebrates. Uh, and so this has been a very challenging project, and Stefan, uh, the master student in charge, has been working on it for quite some time. Okay, so the first thing we had to do is figure out uh, how to identify the prey items. Uh, some of these prey were not found in the standard genetics databases, and so we had to sequence samples ourselves. Uh, so we had to get, so the, the main fish uh, species in the Merced River are rainbow trout, uh, brown trout. Rainbow trout are, are native, but many of the populations in, uh, in Yosemite are, are stocked from, uh, from hatcheries. Uh, brown trout is a species from Europe, so they are non-native. Uh, Sacramento sucker is a native fish. Uh, and then several different species of crayfish are found there. Uh, and all of the crayfish are non-native and they, um, they are, uh, none, none of them are, are native to Yosemite Valley. Uh, and also in sequencing the scat samples, you also get a lot of otter DNA. So we're able to confirm that, the, that an otter made the scat that we collected because uh, we find that otter uh, DNA occurs. Okay, so the steps in doing this work are first you, the easy part is collecting a scat sample from the banks of the river using a kit to extract DNA into a tube like this. Uh, the hard part then is you have to identify, you have to uh, find primers that amplify DNA for invertebrates and vertebrates using PCR. Uh, so you use that to increase the amount of DNA uh, for certain regions of the genome. Uh, you make a, uh, 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 so you make, you take those samples and extract the DNA and amplify it. Uh, one issue is that different species may amplify better than others. And so to determine whether crayfish or fish DNA is uh, more likely to amplify, uh, we created known DNA mixes to eliminate primer bias. So we made mixes with different known amounts of crayfish and trout DNA, uh, and then uh, estimated uh, how much uh, DNA amplified from each of the two groups so we can estimate the amount of primer bias. We get uh, a bunch of DNA sequences. We make a library of those sequences. We go to a computer database and we assign uh, species to them. Uh, and from that, by getting the frequency of sequences, uh, we estimate the frequency of the different prey in the diet. And so this is, we actually haven't completed this step. We're still in this part now. Uh, and so this is just a sort of example database where we have uh, a case where if an otter is eating about 45% crayfish, 45% trout, 10% uh, suckers, uh, you would get something like this, where each bar is an individual scat sample. Uh, and then the colors indicate the percentage of the reads that came from different species. Okay, so then we estimate the, pro the proportion of the different prey in the diet uh, by this means. So then to turn that diet proportion into a number of prey eaten, we have to estimate otter metabolic rate. And so we can use uh, what are called allometric relationships between body size and metabolic rate. So here's a relationship for birds, mammals, you can see reptiles uh, down here have lower, body, lower uh, metabolic rates, uh, so uh, cold-blooded things. Uh, so here's the mammal relationship. So we can estimate the average mass of an otter. From that, we can estimate its metabolic rate uh, and then uh, use an estimate of the digestive efficiency. So how much uh, energy are you able to extract from your food, uh, and then estimate how many kilo, how many kilocalories an otter needs to eat every day in order to satisfy its metabolic needs. And so, if we if we do that, we estimate that if they, an otter is eating nothing but fish every day, it needs to eat about 1.1 pounds of fish a day uh, to to satisfy its metabolic rate. If it's eating nothing but crayfish, it needs to eat almost two pounds of crayfish. So crayfish uh, have, are less calorie rich uh, than, than trout. And so, uh, so th that's if the otter ate nothing. If the otter ate nothing but crayfish and trout, that's what it would have to eat. 
So if we use the size distribution of, of crayfish, of crayfish and trout and suckers in the Sacramento River, we can estimate how many individual animals that would represent. So if an otter was eating only rainbow trout, it would have to eat about two per day. Same for brown trout, a little bit more for Sacramento suckers, they're a little bit smaller. And then for crayfish, each otter would have to eat about 15 crayfish uh, per day to, to, get its, to get its calories. We can use surveys of uh, trout and sucker abundance. So this is abundances, densities, and number per uh, meter squared uh, for fish in different size classes for rainbow trout, brown trout, Sacramento suckers uh, from snorkeling surveys that were done back in the 90s uh, where people snorkeled down the Merced River and counted how many of these different fish they saw in these different size classes. Uh, and from that, we can estimate how much kilograms, how many kilograms of biomass of each of these species exists between uh, Happy Isles and the South Fork of the Merced uh, merger. So where the sort of main section of the Merced River in Yosemite Valley. So we estimate that there's somewhere between 250 and 300 kilograms of rainbow trout, similar amount of brown trout, and a whole lot less Sacramento sucker because they are uh, in general quite a bit smaller. Uh, so this is the total biomass that was present in the river, we estimate, uh, at the time that this survey was done. And so using that, the diet composition, the prey population size, and the consumption rate, uh, we can estimate uh, that a, a single otter, if it ate nothing but fish, would eat about 15% of the fish biomass uh, in the Merced River every year. Uh, so that would be the annual consumption. So a single otter eating nothing but fish could put a pretty good dent in the fish population. If you imagine the otter population is not one, there's more than one, we don't know how many there are, uh, but you can imagine that a family of otters could, could do a pretty solid number uh, on the fish populations, could eat a sizable chunk of the fish biomass uh, every year in the, in, the, uh, in the Merced River. And so we're gonna use, uh, once we have all our sequencing data back, uh, we're gonna estimate how much uh, consumption otters are doing of all these different prey species. Uh, and from that, what sort of impact they might have on the different prey populations based on the energetics and the uh, sequencing data uh, that we get from the, from the SCATs. And so our ultimate goal, so we're hoping this is sort of the first step of this project, uh, is to estimate what sort of impact the otter, the uh, colonization of otters might have uh, on the Merced River food web. So we know uh, that otters are likely to have a fairly strong impact on the fish population and potentially the crayfish population. Uh, fish and crayfish have, a, have themselves a big impact uh, on the river food web. So crayfish are uh, both detritivores and predators of invertebrates. Uh, so they uh, eat algae and, uh, and terrestrial uh, plant detritus and bugs uh, and, so they, and, and aquatic plants as well. Uh, so they likely have a big impact on, on river food webs. Uh, trout and suckers, suckers are sort of algae scum suckers. Uh, they eat, their, uh, they're sort of detritivores and algae eaters. The trout are more predators on insects. Uh, and so by impacting the insect population, they may have uh, impacts on other species that are insectivorous like amphibians or bats or birds. Uh, and so our, our goal is to really uh, try and put together the different pieces of the Merced River food web uh, and understand how uh, the arrival of river otters fits into uh, the, ov the overall picture uh, of the interactions among all of these different species. And also how uh, otters may impact um, restoration projects for pond turtles and for red-legged frogs. So whether, so whether we find evidence of, of frogs and turtles in otter, uh, in otter DNA samples. Okay, so that is uh, sort of where we're at with the river otter project. Uh, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk about another recent arrival. Uh, uh, and this is about, uh, so this is story about the uh, world's largest invasive animal. So largest biomass, uh, which as Carol mentioned is uh, the common hippopotamus in Colombia in the Northern part of South America. And this was research that I did with a number of my, I have other research projects in Colombia as well. Uh, and I did this with a number of uh, Colombian researchers and students uh, from Colombian universities uh, uh, and, uh, and student and postdoc, uh, Natalie, who worked up at SNARL and students from UCSD. So uh, this work was funded by National Geographic and uh, involved uh, researchers from, from Colombia as well as UCSD. 
Okay, so how did there come to be hippos in Colombia? I hear you asking. Um, good question, I'm glad you asked. Uh, so Colombia was in a civil war for about 50 years ending in 2016. So it was a sort of anarchic, uh, anarchic uh, place for a long time. Uh, there was tremendous uh, suffering and displacement. Uh, and during this time, uh, a lot of criminal enterprises really flourished. Uh, and one of the most famous, as anyone who know, who has a Netflix subscription knows, uh, was the Medellin cartel run by Pablo Escobar, uh, who uh, first imported cocaine to North America, um, or for, sort of opened up the cocaine trade, uh, and was at one time, during his time, was one of the richest uh, people in the world, so became sort of fabulously wealthy as a result of doing this. Uh, this is a picture I took at his, we work at his uh, property, his estate. Uh, this is his collection of classic cars. So these are all Rolls Royces and Porsches and uh, old cars that are just rusting into the jungle down there. Uh, and so, you know, if you're, if you're uh, poor and crazy, you're just crazy. But if you're rich and crazy, you're eccentric. And so he was eccentric. And one of his eccentricities was that he had a thing for exotic animals and wildlife. And so he built for himself a private zoo, a collection of animals that included giraffes and ostriches and uh, all sorts of different animals. Uh, and then when he met his untimely end in 1993 uh, in a shootout with the police, uh, the animals, so the collection of animals was redistributed to other zoos. They were all uh, sent off to other places. Uh, but he had a family of hippopotamus living in a lake on his on his ranch. Uh, so he had three females and a male. And nobody was very inspired to swim into the lake and go collect the hippos. Uh, and so everyone decided the best thing to do would be to uh, just leave them where they were uh, and let nature take its course. And so the hippos have spent the 30 odd years since then doing what hippos do best, which is make more hippos. Uh, and so there's now estimated to number somewhere around 100 of them. Uh, and they have spread out from where they started uh, at his ranch and have colonized the uh, Magdalena River Valley, the main drainage uh, that drains into the Caribbean uh, in the central valley of the Andes. There's two uh, ranges of the Andes in Colombia and the, the valley in between them is, is, the, is called this Cordillera Central, it's the central Cordillera of the Andes. Okay, so uh, in so between 1993 when Escobar died and when we began this project, so when we began this project, the estimate the estimate was 65. There were 65 of them. Uh, now the estimate's somewhere between 80 and 100. The truth is nobody has any idea. Uh, it's not an easy place to do anything, even count hippos. Uh, but if you say, okay, let's say the beginning was four uh, and the end was 60, and in 2019 there were 65. Uh, can you can use this equation? It's called the Euler's equation of population growth and estimate the annual growth rate, this little r here. Uh, and so by starting, so the number at time t in 2019 is 65, the initial number is four, uh, the time in between is 26 years or however, however many years it was, uh, and you estimate a 10% annual growth rate. So population growing at a 10% rate uh, would look something like this. Now we don't have surveys, so we don't know what happened in between these years. It may be that it zoomed up to 65 sometime in the early 2000s and stayed there. Probably not. We don't think that's true. Um, but you know, if your population is growing at 10% per year, uh, if, if you have 10 individuals, then every year you add one individual. But if you have 1,000 individuals, every year you add 100. So that means that the population tends to accelerate exponentially upwards like this. And so if we sort of draw that curve out into the future, assuming that the hippo population keeps growing at the same rate, we would estimate that by 2040, there would be 785 of them. Uh, in 2060, there would be about 7,000. Now, this is assuming uh, both that hippos don't run out of uh, whatever hippos need, habitat to live in, uh, and that people continue to tolerate them uh, and don't decide that uh, maybe it's time to do something about the hippos. Uh, so it's not really realistic that there would be 7,000 hippos, but, um, but more realistic studies have been done. So this is a a map of the current hippo range in, in Colombia. So this is Hacienda Napoles, uh, named after Naples in Italy because uh, Escobar was a, a mafia guy. Um, and so this is the population that began. Uh, and this is the basin of the Magdalena River. Uh, and this is a, a huge river and it goes through 
uh, fluctuations in water level and there's um, uh, floodplain lakes that form and, and then sort of dry up. Uh, and these circles are all places where hippos have been observed. Uh, and hippos have now recently been observed almost to the Caribbean coast, so about 300 kilometers downstream to the north uh, from, from here. Uh, there has been sightings of hippos. The good thing about studying hippos is it's fairly unambiguous when somebody sees one. You don't you don't typically confuse them with anything else, uh, and so you, you're able to uh, you're able to know when they have been sighted. So a study came out last year estimating the extent of hippo habitat, trying to estimate what the eventual carrying capacity, the equilibrium size of the hippo population might be. Uh, that's this Casablanco study here. Uh, and this is uh, the, the growth curve where they estimate that they grow exponentially uh, and then sort of top out somewhere around 1500. This is a map of sort of likely hippo habitat uh, spots uh, in, or this sort of this green area is sort of the, the, uh, the likely uh, extent of hippo habitat in the, uh, in the Magdalena Basin. And uh, on either side of this, there are very tall mountains. So it is unlikely that hippos would be able to cross over into other parts of South America out of, uh, out, of this, out of this river basin here. So the estimated carrying capacity is about 1,500 individuals. So the question, sorry, the question we asked is, well, what impact are hippos having on Colombian aquatic ecosystems? And uh, hippos are uh, described as ecosystem engineers. Their effects have been studied in Africa. Uh, there, as their name implies, they're amphibious. They move back and forth. They spend uh, the night typically grazing on land, on grass. So they, are, uh, they typically come out at night and graze on grass. They make these sort of grazing lawns where they graze down the, uh, the vegetation really short to maintain grass uh, dominance. And then they move into the water during the day. Uh, and unlike the otters, they are not very fastidious. And they uh, just go to the bathroom wherever they are. Uh, and so they excrete a lot of uh, waste into the water. So they import a lot of terrestrial plant matter and excrete it into the water where it becomes food and nutrients for microbes like bacteria, algae, fuels algae blooms. Uh, the algae are consumed by invertebrates like these insect larvae, these snails, plankton, uh, fed on by other predatory invertebrates or fish. Uh, many of these invertebrates uh, are uh, aquatic as larvae and they emerge as terrestrial adults and get eaten by things by birds and uh, other, other terrestrial animals. Uh, and so the idea is that hippos really fuel aquatic ecosystem productivity and increase the overall productivity of, of lakes and rivers where they are found, which uh, sounds fairly innocuous, but uh, can also contribute to uh, low to anoxia, to conditions that give rise to uh, mortality events in fish, and also blooms of uh, toxic al of um, harmful algae like cyanobacteria. And so this is an example from a study in Tanzania uh, of hippos complaining, comparing uh, areas with low and high hippo density uh, during the wet season and the dry season. And so this is measures of uh, dissolved oxygen uh, in milligrams per liter here. Uh, which is a matter of how much oxygen is in the water. So when oxygen gets too low, when it gets below about four milligrams per liter, uh, fish and other uh, aquatic animals can have trouble surviving. And this is chlorophyll A concentration. This is a measure of how much algae is in the water, how green the water is. And so what you can see is that in years, uh, in the dry season, these gray bars, in areas with high hippo density, the oxygen concentration is quite a bit lower and below the level that you would expect it to be uh, dangerous for many aquatic animals. Uh, during the wet season, there's no difference. So during the wet season, there's lots and lots of water. And so the hippos are, are sort of diluted over a much bigger aquatic habitat. But during the dry season, they get concentrated into a really uh, sort of tiny little puddles here. Uh, and so you have a huge number of hippos sort of uh, crowding each other in these little puddles. Uh, and you can see the similar thing with the uh, chlorophyll. We're here during uh, the dry season. We see higher chlorophyll in, in hippo, high hippo pools than in low hippo pools. Uh, we didn't see any difference uh, during this second year here. So this all suggests that hippos are sort of fertilizers of aquatic ecosystems. Now, Colombia is a little bit different than Africa in that where hippos live in Africa uh, is quite a bit wetter than all the places they have been studied, or is where they live in Colombia is quite a bit wetter than where they've been studied in, in East Africa, which is sort of a savanna, uh, drier environment like Kenya and Tanzania. 
And so this is the annual precipitation cycle uh, for Colombia and then three sites in East Africa where hippos have been studied, Masai Mara, Laikipa, and, and Ruaha. Uh, and you can see that the, the dry, so here there's two wet seasons in Colombia corresponding to the when the intertropical convergence is around. This is just about on the equator. Uh, and so you can see that the dry season in Colombia is wetter than the wet season in many parts of Africa where hippos have been studied. And just to give you a sense of why, here's just a video I took. Uh, there, there's hippos, but you can't see them. But this is the Magdalena River. Uh, and it's a huge river. It's a few hundred, you know, a couple hundred meters across it never dries up into a little puddle. So hippos are never ever concentrated into a, into a high density uh, in, in Colombia the way they are in Africa. And so our study asked, uh, what is the effect of hippos in Colombia? Do uh, narco hippos have a similar ecosystem effects as regular hippos? Uh, this study got the uh, squid tunes uh, treatment. This is by Garfield, who's an undergrad who worked in my lab who has a uh, aquatic ecology, marine ecology cartooning ser cartoon series, and he makes cartoon versions of, uh, of papers that he finds uh, entertaining or amusing. And so uh, he made one for our, our hippo project and made a cartoon of a, a hippo dressed as Pablo Escobar with the hat and the cigar and everything. Okay, so here was our, so we went out to sample uh, 14 lakes, two that had persistent hippo populations uh, and 12 that did not. We went uh, five times. Uh, to Hacienda Napoles uh, and studied these lakes. Uh, these are, so here is my uh, collaborator, this is my collaborator Nelson, a number of students from his university, here's me. Uh, here we are at the entrance of Hacienda Napoles. This is um, the first plane that Escobar used to fly drugs to the US. Uh, it has been taken down. Uh, they don't, they really don't like celebrating uh, Pablo Escobar as their most sort of famous citizen. Uh, here's a bunch of the students working in the field. Uh, this is Danielle. Uh, who is an undergrad uh, thesis student collecting benthic diatom samples in a lake while a hippo stares at him from, I don't know, maybe a hundred yards away. Uh, I don't know what the environmental health and safety situation is in Columbia. Uh, UCSD would be very unhappy with me if, uh, if a UCSD student uh, waded in with his body into a lake uh, with a hippo nearby. Uh, but Colombians are, uh, are resistant to danger. And, and so he, he, he went right in there to collect his samples. That's true dedication to science. Okay, so here's just some more pictures of our field work. So here we are uh, working with, uh, uh, so here's my colleague Nelson staring at a hippo. So we had to wait for the hippos to clear out so that we could do our sampling. Um, so here, here we are having a sort of a steering contest. Uh, this is a barbed wire fence. There's a cow, cattle rancher, cow, ran, cow rancher showing us uh, where a hippo knocked down his fence. So the hippo just sort of walked through this uh, barbed wire fence that keeps the cattle in. Uh, here's some biologists from the uh, local governmental agency that's in charge of uh, environmental policies there. Uh, and here's my colleague Nelson being interviewed while hippos are grunting in the background. So we were being interviewed on the local TV station uh, and there's the hippos are telling us to go away. So that's kind of the... Uh... <laughs> so there you see the, the Colombian attitude towards danger. Okay, so we decided to compare lakes with and without hippos in terms of community, in terms of ecosystem productivity, uh, in terms of sources of nutrients using uh, stable isotopes, and then in characterizing biological communities, including bacteria, phytoplankton, algae, uh, zooplankton, invertebrates, uh, macroinvertebrates like insects and snails, and then terrestrial vertebrates using uh, soundscape analysis, so recording sounds of birds and bats and frogs uh, and using, uh, com using uh, uh, computer methods to identify organisms by their sounds that they make. Okay, so first I'm just going to show you the results for, uh, for stable isotopes. Uh, so, this is, um, so this is, so we collected algae samples by taking water and filtering it and then using uh, and uh, analyzing the uh, ratios of heavy and light forms of carbon and nitrogen. And these are tracers of sources of nutrients because aquatic plants and aquatic algae and terrestrial plants differ in the proportion of heavy and light carbon. And so terrestrial plants tend to have more C4, C13, aquatic plants tend to have relatively more C12. Um, and so these are the uh, algae samples um, or the, the particular organic matter samples for the lakes, you can see that they are heavier, more similar to terrestrial plants uh, in these hippo lakes. So we had 
uh, lakes with no hippos, with a few hippos and with many hippos. These are the hippo lakes here. All these 12, these, these um, purple points are the no hippo lakes. Uh, and you can see there's some exceptions. There's some no hippo lakes that have very heavy carbon signatures. Uh, but, sig but statistically, the, uh, the hippo lakes had, on average, heavier carbon signatures, indicating that, car that hippos are, in fact, importing terrestrial carbon and increasing uh, the proportion of tr carbon that originated uh, with terrestrial plants. Uh, and so the hippo lakes have more heavy terrestrial carbon, and the no hippo lakes have, on average, uh, lighter aquatic carbon. Next, we put in uh, oxygen loggers that measured oxygen concentration every 15 minutes uh, throughout the day. And we left them for several days in each of several lakes. Uh, so two hippo lakes. And then uh, we, only, we only had four loggers, so we were not able to get as many lakes as we wanted. But we had quite a few days from each lake. Uh, and this is showing the daily cycle. So during the night, so this is, uh, this is uh, midnight, 6 AM. Uh, there's noon, and there's 6 PM. Uh, and so during the night, the oxygen goes down as heterotrophic organisms consume oxygen. And then during the day, so 6 a.m. is on the equator, so 6 a.m. is sunrise. Uh, so during the day, uh, oxygen goes up as plants and algae produce oxygen. Then sometime around 6 p.m. here, uh, the lights go out, and then it starts to go down again. And so the difference between day and night is a measure of ecosystem productivity, the total amount of photosynthesis and respiration going on in those lakes. And you can see the hippo lakes go through about a four milligram per liter uh, range of daily oxygen concentration. The three no hippo lakes went through a statistically uh, uh, smaller range. So they have a smaller daily cycle, uh, but you can see a lot of variation. So this green lake here has almost no difference between day and night. It has a very dampened cycle. The red lake has a, has a slightly bigger cycle about one milligram per liter. And then the purple lake has almost as big a cycle as, as the hippo lakes. And so this suggests that all those nutrients and organic matter that those hippos are importing into those lakes increase ecosystem productivity. They fertilize the lake. They increase the photosynthesis by algae, by adding nutrients uh, and respiration uh, by bacteria, by insects, by everything that uh, eats their waste and also eats the algae that are produced by their waste. So this uh, supports the idea that hippos are, are fertilizers of lake ecosystems. So next we looked at the composition of different organismal communities, uh, the microorganisms like bacteria and algae, uh, insects and invertebrates like zooplankton, uh, and then finally terrestrial vertebrates. I'm just going to show you uh, one example. This is for the phytoplankton. Uh, so these are different uh, groups, divisions of phytoplankton, of algae, microscopic algae, diatoms, green algae, cryptophytes, blue-green algae. Uh, and these are the samples from hippo lakes over here. So five samples from hippo lakes, and then a bunch of samples from no hippo lakes. And what you can see is that these sort of blue-green bars here are bigger in the hippo lakes. They're statistically significantly bigger. And these are the cyanobacteria. So cyanobacteria are more prevalent in the phytoplankton communities of lakes that have hippos than these other groups. And that is consistent with what we would expect because blue-green algae cyanobacteria are indicators of water pollution. They are, uh, they are typically found in nutrient-rich environments that have lots of uh, nutrients being added from external sources. And so this is just comparing the two. You can see the cyanobacteria are about half of the phytoplankton, the algae in hippo lakes, but they're only about a quarter of the algae uh, in no hippo lakes, and that uh, chlorophagrine algae and caryophytes and other groups are more abundant in the lakes that don't have hippos. Okay, so we also looked at the composition of bacteria using sequencing. Uh, so about 5,000 taxa of bacteria. There's no difference in the composition of bacteria found in hippo and no hippo lakes. Uh, and similarly for the invertebrates, the insects, and for the zooplankton, the crustaceans, uh, we also did not find any difference in composition. So we only found significant difference in composition for the, for the algae, for the, for the phytoplankton. And then finally, we use soundscapes by recording uh, sounds and, uh, and trying to identify different uh, groups. And we, we got some data. We were able to, uh, we, were able, we did find significant differences in the kinds of sounds that we heard uh, at, we recorded at the hippo lakes and the no hippo lakes. We were not able to get enough data to really uh, be able to be very confident in those results. So we're, 
uh, we're planning on, in, on doing more in our next phase of this research. Okay, so the important results here that, that hippos import terrestrial carbon and may increase lake productivity. We saw shifts in phytoplankton communities towards more cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, less of other groups of algae. We didn't see any changes in the bacteria, the, the bugs, the, the uh, invertebrates, or the zooplankton. Uh, and so this all suggests that hippos are ecosystem engineers in Colombia, much as they are in Africa, which is perhaps not all that surprising. Uh, the other things to note is that the hippo effect is relatively weak. Uh, that is, the difference between hippo and no hippo lakes is not very uh, dramatic, which is similar to what we see in, in what other studies have seen in Africa during the wet season when hippos are not very concentrated. Uh, hippos are still, I mean, so even though there are hippo lakes, there's not tremendous numbers. We never have densities of hippos where they're concentrated to nearly the same degree uh, as they are in, in African, in East African lakes. Uh, and so their, their effects may be similar to what happens in Africa during uh, the wet season. Okay, so now I'm gonna, uh, Carol, I'm ready for the poll. So I'm, so the question of course on everybody's mind is, well, what should we do about this? Are hippos a problem or are they not? So I'm gonna ask you, the audience, so I have a poll here. So you were able to, uh, the three options are, which are the three options in reality uh, is one is to continue doing what is being done now, uh, which is nothing. So just continue to allow the hippos to go about their business. Uh, and not uh, and not uh, not do anything about them. B is to either ca do something without about them without killing them. So capture them, put them in zoos, or sterilize them. Uh, and then three C is is to shoot them, is to sacrifice, is to lethally uh, control them. So I will let you guys, Carol. I can't see if the poll, the answers to this poll. Can you see that that people are answering? Yep, I, we've got 47% of the vote in. Okay, so I'll give, I'll let you guys, uh, so I'll just let you know that this is a debate that is raging presently in Colombia and beyond. Uh, and this has become a very, very, very contentious issue. Uh, and people have very strong opinions on one side or another. Uh, and so this is, uh, this has gone from an academic debate to a uh, very heated political debate. Carol, is, are, we, is, is it, are we pretty much done? Can we see the results? I think so. Um, I'll end it here. We got okay. about 70%. Can you guys see that? I do not see. Uh, maybe, maybe you need to share. Can you share? Hmm. I don't know how to share that. Um, okay. Maybe you can just, oh, just share no. results. Oh, there we go. Yep. OK, so nobody likes shooting them. So nothing they're great is about almost half. Uh, put them in zoos and sterilize them 42%, shoot them 10%. Okay, so that is, uh, that's a strong result. Uh, that, is, that is interesting. So each of these options has various um, issues associated with it. So nothing, they're great. Yeah, there may be, you know, right now they're not, I mean, there's not uh, causing uh, major catastrophes, but if there's 1,500 of them, that may be different. The other thing to know is that there are other endangered species in the Magdalena River, particularly Antillean manatees, uh, endangered river turtles. So this turtle up here is, a, is an endangered river turtle. Uh, there are other species that could potentially interact with hippos. Catch them, put them in zoos, or sterilize them. Uh, that would be great if somebody wanted 100 hippos. Uh, if anyone in the audience is looking for a new pet, I can, uh, I can put you in touch with uh, the right people. You could be the first one on your block. Uh, so who's going to pay for it? Who's going to take them? Uh, and then shooting them is, is uh, as our poll result, as our poll indicated, uh, unpopular with some, although not with everybody. Uh, and when they have, so there have been hippos that have been causing problems for local people, uh, and uh, they have shot hippos, uh, and it has caused an uproar in Colombia and beyond. Uh, and so the people, uh, my colleague David, who is in charge of this situation, uh, is says that uh, shooting them would cause him a massive headache because he would he would get no no end of grief about it. Okay, so after our paper, so we published the first ever paper about scientific paper about these these hippos. Afterwards, there was the not not I don't think because of our paper, probably just because it was the time. Uh, the media sort of went crazy with this, uh, and there was a um, there was a forum uh, called the Hippo in the Room, the uh, Hippopotamo Hippo in La Sala. Uh, in Colombia, uh, featuring myself as well as a bunch of uh, Colombian members of Congress and various uh, 
uh, various people uh, to debate this question over a very long time. Uh, and the debate became very heated. Um, and um, I'll tell you that it is not an easy thing being in a uh, heated political debate, not in your first language. Uh, my Spanish is pretty good, but in, uh, in sort of delicate political discussions, it starts to break down. But these are some of the, so these are some of the things that people have said. So the hippopotamus is an invasive species in Colombia. Uh, it's situated a situation, if we don't do our part, uh, the population now could be out of control by in 10 or 20 years. It's uh, their presence is a, is disp is, they says, their presence is displacing manatees, which I don't, uh, there's not, uh, there's not, they, they may be displacing manatees. There's no evidence to support that. Uh, a species in danger of extinction, they're contaminating the Magdalena River, they're affecting fishes, and uh, um, they are also an and a dangerous and aggressive animal that are a risk to the population. So anyways, that's, uh, so that's where we're at. <laughs> Um, this, uh, this whole, uh, I could, I'd be happy to talk more about uh, the, the, uh, where the hippo situation. Uh, otters are much less divisive. Everybody is pretty happy about otters. I will tell you that sea otters on Vancouver Island are also very divisive. People who, uh, native people on the, on the island are, uh, are very split on them. So uh, not, not always, uh, not everybody is, is, uh, is in love with these animals as some people. Uh, anyways, uh, thank you very much for having me. That's all I have to say. And I, I'm, I haven't been watching the chat or the question and answer, so I don't know uh, what's going on in there, but I'd be happy to take any questions right now. Okay, thanks, John. And um, what I can do is I can help uh, kind of moderate the questions. So if you guys out there in the audience have questions, um, feel free to just type them in that Q&A section and uh, I can start reading off some of the questions. I, I think the noise from children was in fact from my children. <laughs> they, I know it's not mine. She's they're not here and they're noisy. <laughs> um, okay, well, uh, the first question we've got, John, yeah. is from Scott someone Cooper. you know, Scott Cooper. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, and Scott's asking, why are otters reinvading or increasing in the Merced River now? So, so it's very interesting. So they're, they're actually invading for the first time. They were never recorded there before. John Muir did not report them. Uh, Grinnell did not. They're, they were never known to be in the Merced River. Um, they came up during the drought, uh, the 2013 to 15 or so drought. Um, and uh, during that time, crayfish were increasing quite a bit. Uh, so it may well be uh, that crayfish increased and the otters just sort of followed them up there. Uh, when low during the uh, drought, the low flow years may have allowed crayfish to increase. That's a theory as good as any theory. Uh, we don't have any, uh, we don't have any real uh, data or anything to support that. Um, but uh, it may, they, they were never reported there before. Um, so they are not, um, they were not known from the Merced River, from, from Yosemite Valley. They're at, they're in the Merced at lower elevations. And then, All right. Why is there so much uh, stable variation among the hippo, the no hippo lakes? Uh, um, so the lakes are all, so this whole region is uh, very impacted by cattle ranching uh, and by palm oil. And so a lot of the lakes are in a very sort of agricultural uh, landscape. Um, and so there are um, lakes that are in a sort of you know, tropical rainforest. The, the floodplain lakes on the river are in, are, some of them are in sort of more natural situations. Uh, the lakes at Hacienda Napoles, where we studied them, are all in sort of cattle ranching. Uh, and there's also, there's another invasive species, which is Asian water buffalo, uh, which were brought there to drag um, palm oil, palm fruits for palm oil, uh, around and so they were they were imported as a beast of burden uh, and so there are also water buffalo there as well uh, and so many of the non-hippo lakes are themselves quite contaminated and quite eutrophic. Uh, can uh, can uh, otters be considered bio? Yeah, uh, so that's a very interesting question. Um, so um, so otters are likely. Uh, going to, going to have a significant impact on the crayfish population. Um, they so crayfish are a definite invasive species. Uh, trout are an invasive species as well. 
uh, although they are uh, one that people are often quite fond of. Um, and so they may well have, the otters may well have, and so, you know, an otter will eat whatever it wants to eat. It doesn't care whether it's native or invasive, right? So they may well be eating pond turtles. They may well be eating crayfish, you know, so whether they're, you know, how their impact is felt by native endangered and exotic species uh, is a question that the park is very interested in and that we are working with Rob to try and answer uh, because obviously there's a lot of concern that you know, they may, they may have, uh, they may have negative, they may have, they may, they may reduce some invasive species like the crayfish, uh, but they may also have some impacts on, on some in other, some endangered species. All right. Uh, any other last questions? All right. Well, I just want to thank you, John. That was such a great talk and uh, thanks. thanks again. And See you guys all next week. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Let's see. Get out of here.